uh, eBay, BBC, uh, Meredith, and um, uh, they do 20 billion impressions per day. And if you think that's a lot, they do actually 300 billion RTB auction ad, uh, motions uh, every single day as well. That's 300 billion auctions a day is what uh, PubMag participates in. So this guy has a lot of lessons of scale and analytics, and I look forward to his book. I'll just uh, go over a little bit, of, little bit of my background. So I've been working at Pomatic since 2008 uh, um, when the company was very, very small. Um, and um, I've worked on a lot of uh, different uh, you know, uh, uh, products at Pomatic. And uh, recently I was involved in uh, building out uh, the data platform for Pomatic. So, um, so we, we completely kind of revamped uh, our old technology stack with some new technologies. and, and, and and have also had a chance to work with the ad server team on Aerospike. So I think um, 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 I just wanted to check how many people out here are familiar with ad tech? Like, OK, um, not many. So I'll just briefly introduce the Matic and some of the ad tech uh, you know, stuff that we do. So um, on, uh, out here, you would see um, on, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the different type of publisher that we work with. So, so this is kind of the, e the ecosystem, or, or this is kind of uh, the, the stack that Pomatic has, the kind of technologies that Pomatic is, or products that Pomatic is building. On the left-hand side, you will find uh, publishers and the different type of inventory the publishers have. So they work with, um, you know, they work on, on, on different types of, they have, they have a lot of different types of inventory. Like they have uh, websites which are, um, uh, you know, uh, which 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 are like e-commerce websites, uh, news websites. Uh, there's a lot of inventory or, or impressions coming from uh, different types of devices like tablets, mobile inventory, and we are we are, we are soon getting into native as well as in, in, into connected TVs. So that that portion out there is our is our publisher who who the and, and we we kind of monetize that inventory using our product. And on the on the right hand side, you'd find all the demand entities uh, like the advertising agencies, uh, you know, the, the DSPs, uh, uh, advertisers who we work with. So the auction engine or the formatic engine actually um, is an algorithm that would provide uh, the best uh, value for an impression that comes to formatic. So, so uh, it will churn a lot of values, a lot of targeting, uh, you know, parameters into the auction and it would it would it would select the best ad that could serve on that inventory. So pretty much everything is programmatic and we we do auction at all different levels like the direct sold, um, uh, even open RTB. And 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 RTB is is, is more of a of a real time trading um, uh, environment where where whenever we get an impression we would send out bid requests to uh, you know dozens of different DSPs we would get a bid response, and then that data, and, 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 and we would select the best bid that would win. So I think just to figure, just to just to give you an idea of the data points that we have. So on the on the right hand side, you'd find uh, different types of channels from where the inventory is coming through. So on the, on, on, and, and 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 the inventory. So when, when an impression comes to Pubmatic, we would figure out which years it is coming from, right? What users uh, are involved in that particular impression. Um, you know, if, if it's coming from mobile, we would be tracking a lot of information about the mobile device, the UIDs, the OS, um, you know, the app URLs, etc. For video, similarly, we would be checking whether it's a pre-roll, it's a post-roll. Tons of things that come to Pubmatic, um, and those are those are some of the logs that we collect uh, when we are when we are serving the impression. Um, and, and similarly for on the on the on, on the demand side, so when we are doing an actual auction, we would be we would be logging a lot of values of why a particular bidder didn't win the auction. So could be because of the low price, it could have been uh, you know flagged as a 
uh, as a brand violation by the you know based on the publisher's interest. So all that data is 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 collected in our system. So as Ryan mentioned, all the 20 billion impressions that come to Formatic, we are logging all that information from our ad servers into into our into our system. Um, there is one more important aspect. So uh, okay, so just to give you some trends. Uh, we do 20 billion impressions per day. Um, um, you know, this, that's that's close to 250 billion uh, uh, RTB requests. Uh, we collect uh, 20 terabytes of compressed data on a daily basis. Uh, sorry, 30 terabytes of compressed data on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have close to a 350 node, uh, you know, a Hadoop cluster, which is crunching all that data and generating an analytics. And, uh, and the users, we, we uh, and the, the user side, we see close to 450 million units uh, globally um, per month. So that's that's a lot of a lot of data um, that goes into our system. Um, so I'm going to cover two major uh, areas today. So one is uh, the real time, um, you know, analytics or the real time uh, data that we, you know, that are that our ad server uh, uses during the optimization. As well as I'm going to touch uh, up on, on on the ad, on the on the data uh, crunching or the data processing stack that we have at at Formatic. So getting into the real time uh, optimizations, as I, as as I mentioned, among uh, among the among the lot of parameters that come to Formatic uh, with every impression, I think one of the most important uh, you know uh, 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 parameters is, is the user ID. So user ID basically represents uh, who is giving the impression, right? Um, and um, to to make more value for that for that impression, we collect data or or we have data flowing in into a system from different data data, data management platforms. So uh, such as Blue Sky, Durhami. So a lot of our publishers work with these partners to segment their user data. So uh, some of the segments would be like. How many of our users are are male? How many are interested in auto? How many are, uh, you know, um, you know, are, are are between the age group of 25 and 40? So there will be a lot of direct deals that will be targeted specifically for these audiences, and the ad server at real time would be identifying whether this user lies into this segment and associate that impression value to it. So I think so. So in the sense that. Uh, uh, when you when you when you're able to identify the user lying in a segment, you you can you can sell it at a better price, and 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 that's that's how this data is so important. Um, so yeah, as I said, uh, millions of user IDs that we collect. Um, 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 along with that, uh, a lot of other demand partners that we work with also have their also have their own way of identifying users. So. In, in short, we have to map our user ID with their user ID. So we have a lot of mappings that we store on our side, because when when we get our user ID, we would we would fetch their user ID and send it to them so that they could identify their user, right? And 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 uh, and the third part was basically you know the audience segmentation information. Uh, going into the data flows like the stack or, or the, how the data flows, so. Uh, we have server-to-server -server data transfer or data data which is coming to us from different BMPs, which are the data management platforms. So that is that is billions of rows of information that that flows into our system, um, um, which which is basically um, so we have an ATL process uh, to crunch that data and to associate those user IDs with our own user IDs. Um, and then the other two sync ups are basically we have, as I said, we have to do sync ups with with different data. With the different demand partners who are working with us to associate our IDs with them, so so that's a sync up, and this happens real time uh, um, during the ad when when the ad is being displayed or when the page is being browsed by the user, that that would be giving a lot of calls to our system, which would be um, mapping these entities into our system, and then there's the formatic user ID sync. So I think the the second two are are, are kind of uh, the way in which we sync users into a system so that the audience data that we got from the data providers as well as the data that we have from the demand partners, they make sense. Um, when the, uh, so so uh, the user data basically flows into um, our HDFS uh, cluster. So we, we, we get that information, we store it into our 
uh, HTFS. There, uh, uh, but that data is also crunched and, and put into Arrow Spike. But Arrow Spike currently today holds uh, a lot of our user mappings. So if we have a user, it would store a lot of mappings for that user, as well as segment information for that user. So it's a complex data structure uh, that is created in Arrow Spike every time we get more information about the user. And um, on, on the right hand side, you see that this information that we have for a user is used in the real time. So, so, so um, you know, our app server at every impression would check whether this user belongs to a particular segment or a group of segments uh, that has been defined in the system and would, would associate a particular value to the impression, right? So, so that, that happens. So this um, arrow spike uh, or, 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 the, or the central store, which stores our, our user information, is, is getting called almost 70% of the time uh, from our app server, uh, which turns down turns out to be around 12 billion reads from Arrowspike uh, per day. Um, um, and then, and then the, this data, which is, which is collected from the different DMPs, is also associated with the impressions that are actually served. And, and, and we could then uh, figure out analytics of what are the users what are the top segments? Like we can associate dollar value to the user segments that we have in a system by saying, okay, this this particular user segment of male and auto editors were the most were the top selling segment, um, uh, and, and 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 so on. So so um, and again, I'm going to cover a little bit of um, you know the data processing layer in the later slides, but I think this slide is mainly focused on. The real-time use case where we where we where we query the data store uh, of billions times billions of times uh, to to get that user information and to make sense of that impression. Uh, some of the traffic stats. So we do around two billion. Uh, we have so we have around two billion users in the in the, in, the, in this in the store in the system. Uh, that is again a little bit inflated because a lot of users will have multiple devices and you know those those users will be will be. Uh, stored as well too. Uh, we have close to 18 terabytes of data in this store. Uh, we do around 13 billion reads per day, and 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 with all the writes that are going on at the store, we we do close to 11 billion writes. Um, uh, on the Arrowspike side, we we are deployed with Arrowspike in in four different data centers. Uh, there's a replication uh, which is set up between these two within the U.S. data centers. So we have replication set up between the U.S. data centers. Um, we have close to 100 terabytes of uh, SSG capacity in that cluster, and um, you know close to 30 nodes which are running across PCs. Um, so yeah, I think I, 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 this is um, so. This was kind of the real-time um, scenario where where we are, we are looking at a lot of user IDs. Uh, and, 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 and using that in the real-time option. Um, I would go forward. So going, uh, so another use case that we cover at Formatic is, uh, you know, crunching, um, you know, terabytes of data, which is collected by our ad server, um, 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 you know, while serving 20 million impressions. As I said, uh, for each impression that we get, we, we take a lot of decisions. We take close to 150 decisions per, per impression uh, to figure out, uh, you know, what bits are, uh, which bits would be filtered, which, would, which bits would actually go into the auction, uh, which is the best bid, et cetera. So, 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 so that, that whole auction log is logged, uh, you know, uh, into, into our, it becomes kind of the data that we want to analyze. Um, we do close to four, 100k peak impressions per second. Um, uh, the ads of the logs are getting generated across five different data centers. So we have a lot of ads servers running in different data centers, and this data is being collected across those regions, and then we are collating that information in one region and doing the data processing. Um, uh, we have close to 30 uh, terabytes of data, uh, which comes down to kind of five gigabits of uh, uncompressed data at the peak. Right at the, at the peak time, so at, at that so peak time, that would be the data that would be collecting. Um, and 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 as I said, because there are a lot of targeting values and a lot of um, decisions we take during the auction, 
that everything, if we record everything, is most close to 150 different uh, you know, parameters that we collect in a single log, which, which comes down to around 6 to 25 KB per impression. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very complex data structure. Uh, this is kind of our uh, current uh, stack uh, that we that we so so we had a we we, we were doing data processing in our in our legacy data uh, I'm calling it legacy because we moved on to this one so we were doing um, uh, data processing in our in our in our local colo uh, data 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 centers and we recently moved to to cloud and to to this to this data platform. Uh, uh, so, I will just give an give overview of all the layers out here. Um, so, on the top you would see all the ad servers. So, um, I haven't represented all the data centers, but we would have like two more data centers which are pushing in data. So, whenever we get impressions to coming into the ad servers, they would be they would be um, they would be uh, uh, collecting that log. And sending to an entity called Logger, which is which is kind of a pragmatic built entity. Now, and then and then we'll be sending data to uh, the pipe. So, I think you'll be wondering why why an entity called Logger, why 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 not directly to Kinesis or Kafka? So, um, the reason why we built uh, that layer of Logger was because we didn't wanted uh, the ad server to take. A decision whether I, we have to put into Kinesis or we have to put in Kafka, right? We we wanted ad server to perform uh, or, or think or, or, or do only ad serving and, and take that decision making whether to choose a particular channel to send the data through uh, in, in a separate layer, right? So we were focusing on not having ad server take those decisions, not having ad server do um, um, you know error handling, right? So if, if if one of those one of those channels are have failed. We, we didn't want an ad server to uh, do error handling or store data locally on the system. Uh, that that could that could be that could hamper the actual purpose or the ad serving purpose, right? So, so I think the, the layer below it, the logger, it's it's abstracting um, ad server out of all the all the data flow or or how, how how the data needs to be handled, what error handling handling should be done. So I think that layer is abstracting ad server from that, and ad server is being kind of only sending it or kind of fire and forget kind of thing, where it just sends to the logger, and these loggers are nothing but uh, a simple, you know, web applications which are which are performing at a very high speed. So they would be uh, fetching or, or they would be able to handle close to eight thousand to ten uh, k QPS. Uh, so the ad server would just you know throw in data to the loggers and forget about it, and that's the only thing uh, that the ad server will do. The logger in turn will we we'll do a lot of things. Logger. So, um, the logger's main purpose is to send this data to a central warehouse. So the logger decides which. I think we, we so we've built two different pipes, which 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 connect our data to a store. So when the when the data comes to logger in the real time, uh, as as packets of ten impression or data, uh, they could either be put into Kinesis or Kafka. The reason why we 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 built uh, two layers is because ingestion is of, of such a large amount of data is 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 a, is a risk, right? So if you if you're not able to uh, ingest that data due to some reason, or if one of your pipes fail, the entire flow is hampered, right? So if you don't have data, you cannot process it. So we wanted to make sure that the pipes that send data to our system have a backup, right? So so we built, we, 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 we did a POC on two different technologies. Since we're moving to AWS, we thought of using Kinesis as an alternate. And, and we started doing POC on Kinesis when, you know, when, when they launched, I think, around February last year. So we started working with Kinesis when they were only available in New York. Um, and, and, and we started, um, uh, we started, we, we wrote some, so we wrote we wrote uh, a client libraries and a logger to send data to Kinesis, and and we wrote consumers which would which would run in, in AWS and would consume the data that is put in the Kinesis. So Kinesis stream today gets close to um, um, you know um, 
it, 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 it gets close to uh, 2 billion requests, right? It could get close to, so what we do is we, we crunch, um, um, we, of the 20 billion impressions that we get, we combine 10 impressions, deliver it, and send it to Kafka, uh, to Kafka and Genesis. So it gets called around 2 billion times per day, um, and it collects, you know, 30 terabytes of data in S3. So we have, um, so we have streams. So um, Genesis is, has, has a concept of stream. So you have, you can create a stream, um, which, and the capacity of the stream can be, can be, can be, controlled by something called shard. So every shard has one MB per second, uh, 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 you know, ingestion rate and two MB per second pull rate. So you can add a lot of shards and create a stream, which would pull in a lot of data. So, so logger would send that data to Kinesis, and 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 we have consumers which will be pulling data from the stream and, and pushing into S3, um, and converting into Avro Snappy, which is our you know format of of, of storing the data into S3. Um, Similarly, Kafka, right? So Kafka is, is well known. It's it's no it's 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 being used by a lot of companies. So it's nothing uh, nothing uh, new out there. But yeah, we we we've used Canvas consumers instead because it provides some more flexibility in terms of uh, managing the offset, right? So you don't have to worry about uh, keeping track of offsets. A uh, Canvas will do it for you. It will auto discover topics, etc. So I think Canvas works out there. Uh, we use. Um, you know, one of these two. Uh, currently, we are using Genesis, and we have close to 500 stream, uh, 500 shards in the stream. We have five streams uh, in, in five different you know data centers, which which are which are running through Genesis. Um, moving on to the next layers, I think storage is 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 very um, very simple. I mean, if you if you if you are on cloud, if you are on AWS, I think S3 becomes your it becomes your by default storage, uh, and it's it's better uh, because you can you can put a lot of a lot of amount of data out there and forget about it. In the sense that you don't have to think about uh, increasing the capacity or adding disks, which you you tend to do when you're running your own data center. Um, uh, going on to the next layer, so I think when we when we were running our old data center, our our, our processing in our old data center. We used to do a lot of tiered processing, so which means that when when we got raw data, we would we would we would do an ETL and separate uh, winning information from the all information, and then and then we have would have another tiered job, which would take this data and convert it or, or aggregate it to another level, and and so on. So we would we would we would keep aggregating until it is it it could be dumped into MySQL, and and we could run you know UI through it. So. So we were we were doing a lot of tier jobs. Um, we were using Hive Pig uh, very extensively. We were writing MapReduce jobs, and we had our own system, which would which was which was which was which was you know uh, uh, storing all the metadata. So if the first tier job got completed and it generated a certain amount of files, we would put those entries in the MySQL so that the next job would identify which files it has to you know. Uh, Process and, and take it forward. So I think you're doing a lot of tiered processing, um, and and one of the reasons why we chose cascading here because we we still wanted to do some of those tiered processing, but we wanted to do it in a sophisticated manner. We knew the flows, right? We knew the pipes. We knew the aggregation that has to be done, um, and and cascading gives you that flexibility. It, it allows you to create pipes. It allows you to to um, you know, to to write simple uh, logic of, of 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 which data source after after aggregating it, which uh, which next sorry which other job would consume that data and and, and provide you your uh, data. So I think cascading is helping us out in that sense where we know our flows and we could we could we could ex execute those flows through a through a well defined system. Uh, edge space. Uh, Again, it's a it's a very standard data warehouse. Uh, a lot of people use HBase. Um, we store our aggregate data, so we store uh, whatever data that gets aggregated on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, into HBase. Um, and 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 um, you know that 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 data is, is uh, that data is queried using Phoenix. Uh, so Phoenix is a is an open source um, 
you know, um, querying uh, system or, 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 you know, it, it provides SQL-like APIs on top of edge base. Uh, it was open sourced by Salesforce. Um, the reason why we chose Phoenix was because it, 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 it was, it was a lightweight system. Uh, it gave, you know, SQL-like interface. It was easy to set Phoenix with, with, with edge base. You know, you just have to put the jar in, in the lib file and, you know, you can power up the, power the Phoenix client. Uh, Phoenix client was easy to use and they also have a lot of optimizations that you do on the server side. So when you're firing up a query, they would do a lot of value processing by taking your rookie, um, you know, uh, inner bound, upper bound, and, and this, you know, um, and, and, and doing a lot of processing on the edge base region server rather than doing a lot of aggregation on the client side. So Phoenix was, 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 was because of those optimizations and, and basically we wanted to query that data from our UI. And then, and then we wrote uh, a, a Java-based you know, API, uh, which is a simple REST API, uh, which takes dimensions, metrics, um, and, 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 and you know, internally fires a query, which gets data from edge base and, and powers up the UI. UI is, is, is built using D3 and some custom uh, you know, um, um, widgets that we created, for example, for for heat maps, we created a few more widgets which which power our UI. Um, yeah, I think this sums up. Uh, I want to quickly touch upon the two items that I did: the real-time analytics platform and the ad hoc. So, currently, we're using uh, third-party tools out there. So, we are using Data Torrent for real time. So, the data is, is pushed from Kafka into the real-time system, and you know, Data Torrent does our real-time aggregation. And for ad hoc analysis, we're using a tool called Qball. So that's another thing that we that we plan to do uh, with this, that we wanted to separate out ad hoc queries out of our main you know, system. So a lot of times you would run very uh, you know, high performance ad hoc queries just to get <coughs> just to crunch like terabytes of data, uh, just to debug a certain scenario, right? Or or to or so, so that would that would hamper your main flow, and a lot of engineers have to have to spend time uh, finding out uh, whether there's a capacity, schedule jobs accordingly, etc. So, I think um, that's one decision that we that we made during this time that we want to keep ad hoc reporting separate from our mainstream reporting. Um, so we're using tools called Qball, and they they allow us to uh, basically give a nice user interface, which can be used by the non-tech users. Um, just to write some high queries, get their data, uh, you know, analyzed. Um, yeah, that's 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 a stack. That's a data stack at Pubmatic. Um, um, yeah, I think that this is what I wanted to cover. Um, so, so, yeah, back to you, Brian. Okay, so um, now is our chance to. Ask Kunal about uh, some of the. Uh, have a seat. Yeah. Relax. So uh, I, I thought I'd just uh, start off with uh, maybe one or two questions, uh, but I've, I've been told this crowd's very lively in terms of. Uh, well, we're, we're both going to talk though, so. So, uh, so let me ask one question uh, to sort of kick it off, but I've been told this is a very interactive crowd. I bet you have a bunch of my uh, uh, questions based on what he presented. So, um, so you guys went from your own data center to Amazon, and that's often considered challenging for real-time cases, right? We all know it's a, it's a couple milliseconds and the network hop and a lot of variations. So you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the transition and sort of what you found, um, some of your thoughts on, on the Amazon transition. Right. So, um I think uh, that was yeah, yeah that was a big transition. So we were doing a lot of processing in our in our in our own data centers, and then we moved to Amazon. Uh, so some of the challenges that we saw is is getting data out from our system and moving to S3. So that was that was one of the biggest challenges. So um, when we when we were working with Kafka, we we analyzed a lot of options, and 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 and. We, we did we did a direct connect you know so we are using a direct connect file which 
So we had to do a lot of capacity planning of how much data is going to flow between our data center and Amazon. Uh, what, which, what should be the output, you know, network bandwidth that we would have to configure in our data center? Uh, because a lot of times when when we are doing processing in our internal data centers, we are using the internal bandwidth, which is which is different because you have to you have to you have to make your network pipes, you know, that that. Uh, you, have to, you have to plan the capacity for your network pipe. So, so that was one thing we we try to you know we we use Direct Connect for Kafka, and that was again one of the reasons why we chose to to do a POC and and, and start with Genesis because it was it was a, it was a solution that was solving our problem of pushing the data real time from our app servers our loggers directly into 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 S3. So I think those were I think biggest challenge was. Pushing the data out from our data center, pushing it to to AWS, and then again, um, there are complexities. You you're working on certain versions of you know software on your own data center, and you're comfortable with it, and you suddenly have to learn a lot of you know um, AWS. So so I think there was a learning curve in terms of um, using uh, you know uh, an using the you know using um, um, AWS and and. and and, and and we we had we had a lot of help from the IT team and that. Yeah. the real time analytics in here. Can you tell us what you thought initially? Did you plan on using the same technology as you, you planned, or did you change the technology as you go further? Uh, what was your um, idea regarding the real time analytics in here? Right. So um, when we started, actually we started doing a lot of POC and Storm. Um, uh, and we wanted to use Kafka with Storm, uh, but then um, we we had some issues, and you know um, um, we started analyzing other third-party partners who would be doing that. So I think we analyzed Storm, but but we found that it's a it's it's something that we would need more uh, you know help on in terms of building that infrastructure. So currently we are we are working with Data Torrent, um, which. Which is which is doing that for us. So they have their own setup, and we are sending impressions to them, and they are doing the crunching. But we are also looking. We are also doing some POCs around sparse streaming to figure out if we can. So we already have Genesis pipe. We want we want to check whether uh, you know uh, we can we can turn on Genesis to Spark and then do the stream processing out there. So I think yeah. So I think um, we we did some POC and Storm. Uh, uh, but but because of you know the time constraints and because of you know um, 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 the, the challenges in, in getting those minute level coding out, we we, we started working on it. My question is: uh, As you've created complex architecture to solve that as a problem, uh, it seems to me that as you create this new like architecture you open yourself to another problem, which is the actual monitoring of this and meaning your SLAs. So yeah. how are you solving that problem from layer to layer to layer to layer? Right, so that's a very good question. So I think um, um, we are, so on the on the ad server and logger, we already have a lot of monitoring in place. So we, we, are, we are monitoring the rate of flow at which the data comes to the logger, and we're monitoring the rate of flow, rate of flow at which the, the, the Loggers are sending requests to Genesis or sending requests to to uh, uh, to Kafka. Uh, on on the on the Kinesis and Kafka side, we have active monitoring in terms of how much data is getting approximately collected into S3. So Kinesis gives us so we use CloudWatch with Kinesis, and it would tell you how much data is flowing through. Uh, we're monitoring a lot of stuff. We're monitoring the average latency of push. We are monitoring. The amount of data that is being flowing per second into the streams. Uh, we also monitoring the data that collects into our RD buckets. So we have a fair idea that with this many impressions, this is the data that would be collected at peak time. This would be collected at the systems at, at the non-peak hours. So we're monitoring those uh, events. Uh, on the data processing side, we uh, we 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 have alerts again in terms of uh, if the RD data got got pushed into H3 or not, we have mechanisms in place where uh, if the data is lagging by some time, we would, we would auto reprocess. Unless, unless the data, if, if there's a lot of lag, then we would require manual intervention, but, but small lag is, is maintained. So it's similar to what HFTs are going through, you know, there are battles between you know, which packets to wire, you know, using an option, using an option, and then, you know, 
identifying the network installation or the application yeah. as you go to solve the problem in place, right? right? So these are, I guess, still challenges that you're Yeah, so that is, yeah, that is again a uh, challenge. So I think we um, we have, we use Nagios very, uh, very, you know, extensively uh, for, for the network monitoring in our app servers and our loggers. And then we're using uh, CloudWatch uh, for, for the other. You're, you're sitting at the edge of the, yeah. Know, the challenge yeah. of yeah. benefits. So, uh, actually, I, let me uh, I exert my privilege here. So, how many people do you have doing that kind of ops work for sort of the, these tiers? Is it tens of people, fifties of people? Uh, not I, I mean, really Amazon tells you you don't need any ops people, right? Uh, <laughs> right. So, I think we have. Um, we, so our data processing stack is in Amazon, but we also have a lot of infrastructure in our own colo. So as I mentioned, we have like five different data centers. And, and, and most critical uh, uh, part of our system, our app server is in those colo, is in, in those systems. So I think um, uh, we have close to 20 people uh, who are actively you know, monitoring a lot of stuff, like the load balancers of the app server, the actual app server traffic that is coming through these logger servers, um, there is some data processing happening even in our colo data center. So a lot of, lot of you know, uh, monitoring has to be done on those areas. So I think you, you do require uh, people uh, also looking at the data. It's not just something that's purely automated. Back there? Actually, yeah. uh, my question is, what do you do in terms of security and encryption for your um, no SQL and application environments because uh, working with customers in the last few years for implementing cloud and big data seems to be a, a pain point with them. Um, at this point, we are um, um, we're not doing um, um, a lot of encryption of our data. Um, um, so we um, so this data is is again closed into our VPC. So. We are not we're not allowing any external access. Everything is accessed through our APIs. So this layer is still inbound within our VPC. 